Thank you, snowboarding. Thank you, snowboarding. Thank you, snowboarding. Thank you, snowboarding. snowboarding. Hey friends, welcome back to Thank You Snowboarding, the podcast made in association with the Snowboard Asylum that is delving into and telling the stories of UK snowboard culture. So this week's story, this is really epitomises what I hoped this podcast would become. Um, After the first episode, Graham Chalmers got in touch with me and it was a name that I'd sort of... I seem to remember from back in the day, maybe printed in one of the early editions of Snowball GK or something. I didn't really know much more about him, but it turns out he's got quite the story. And uh, his son had said, you know, Dad, you used to have this amazing history and you did all this stuff in the sport and you've never really told your story. And so he got in touch to see whether I'd like him on as a guest and it was an absolute pleasure. What a great person. What a great history. He kind of lived slightly outside of the UK scene. He basically built a board, learned how to snowboard, went to Italy, hooked up with a mate, and just decided there and then, literally there and then, like, this is going to be my life. I'm moving, I'm moving to Europe. And did so. And uh, I can certainly relate to that thing of just falling in love with it and deciding to make it your life immediately. So it felt like we had a lot in common, even though we got into the sports at different times. There's still that sort of idea. And I know this is becoming a bit of a common theme that when you met a snowboarder back in the day, you instantly became friends because there were so few of you doing it. And I think that's really special. So yeah, Graham explains all this in his in this episode. He also talks a bit about when he went to the King of the Hill in Alaska and was hanging out with Sean Farmer and all those guys. Can't imagine what that must have been like at the time. Proper Wild West, big mountain snowboarding. Um, what else? Yeah, there's the time he went on, or nearly went on the Playboy jet to Las Vegas. Um, yeah, just sort of craziness that all kind of lived outside of the UK spectrum a little bit, but is intrinsically part of UK snowboarding anyway. He's even worked with people like Mac Dog and uh, Full Line Films, people like that, helping them get movies put together. Hence the music you're listening to underneath this, but we'll talk about that more at the end. So yeah, we'll be back at the end for some housekeeping, doing all that business, talking about other stuff. Um, But yeah, let's get into it now. This is Graham Chalmers. Let's go. Yeah, well, do you know Matt Barr? I do know Matt Barr, yeah. Sideways, yeah. Well, it's, it's funny, somebody sent me a link not so long ago to one of the Looking Sideways podcasts, and they said, oh, you're in it. And I was like, what? Oh, really? And I went in, and it was with Neil Haynes. Do you know Neil Haynes, the photographer? No, I don't, actually. Uh, he was, he's sort of, yeah, one of the sort of most prominent adventure sports photographers in the UK, and he was sort of talking about the early days. Yeah. We're, we're talking, phew, I think mid to late 80s and Neil came out to stay with me and we got like lots of sort of shots together and it sort of helped his career as well as mine it was a kind of it, yeah it worked for both of us so but anyway so so that that was quite nice and that brought a lot of memories flooding back as well so yeah it was good yeah well we'll probably get in we'll we'll get in we'll get into that but um we'll probably sort of head head backwards first um i reckon well, we'll try and sort of cover as much as we can in about an hour, I guess. Yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. I mean, just looking at the, looking at your timelines and the things that you were like, oh, here's some things we could talk about. I mean, there's, we could talk for hours. I'm sure we yeah. could, but it, I'm, I'm aware that uh, we'll keep it relevant. Know, let's 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 well, let's just see where we get to. Um, sometimes yeah. I have a bit of a plan, but given that you've given me all this stuff, I've sort of I've not really made a plan, and we'll just try and maybe get around some of it and see where we get to. So I guess the first place to start was because um, we've had Stuart, I don't know if you know Stuart Duncan. He was an early Scottish snowboarder. I do know the name, yeah. And he had a vert ramp or he built a vert ramp somewhere in Scotland as well. And that was kind of his entry point. So that that's what sort of in... In your sort of timeline as well, that's what kind of made me think, oh, maybe you two know each other because yeah. 
he seemed to have this skating and sort of building vert ramp kind of experience. Mm. Tell me a bit about that. Yeah, well, I was, um, you know, I started skating in the, the 70s, you know, when I was a, a little kid. My brother was a skater. And uh, so I got into it. And this was in the early days when it was just a piece of wood with really basic, almost like roller skate bindings. Yeah. And, and as soon as I went on my first skateboard, I knew that was it. That was the sport for me. And I just absolutely loved it. And then I sort of hooked up with quite a lot of the sort of good skaters in and around Edinburgh and became really good friends with them later on. You know, Davy Phillips, who went on to sort of form clan skates. And uh, and then there was, we got to know a lot of the other sort of guys like Sean Goff and Pete Doss, a lot of the big oh, yeah. skaters in the UK at that time. Yeah. And even Jeff Rowley, who was, um, which was Death Box at that time. I think that was around about. I think mm, so, yeah. Mid to late 80s. I'm not a skate um, aficionado, so I don't want to yeah, say anything so, in case I get hit up for being wrong. So, yeah, so the early days of skateboarding, and that was it. And I was, you know, I knew that that was going to be the, one of the most important things in my life. And we also skied as a family, you know, I skied as a, as a kid, you know, I started skiing when I was about five. My dad was a skier. And then I think it must have been ooh, the early 80s at some point, reading an episode of, uh, sorry, an edition of Thrasher, and there was a little bit of snowboarding in Thrasher and how to make right. your own snowboard. And I was like, All right, that's it. That's for me. Went down to a wood yard and got wood and made my made my first board. And I, I can't even remember when that was. And I remember having to go to the local sort of junkyard and cut seatbelt, car seatbelts out of an old car to try and make <laughs> foot straps. You know, a little bit like windsurfing foot straps. Yeah, sure. And just going down the local hill and I just, yep, yeah, and that was it. So that was the whole start. And um and I tried to replicate what I was doing on a skateboard and a snowboard just on these little hills in Scotland. And then I think it must have been about 83, 82, 83, went up to, with a couple of other guys, we went up to one of the ski areas. I think it was Glen Shee. And they just looked at us like we were aliens. And we were like, can we get up the lift? Can we go up the lift? And it was like an absolute no-no. So we ended up just hiking up and coming down on these kind of homemade boards. That's amazing. And, could, and I could see the lifty at the time looking at us and just thinking, these, these guys could actually stay on their feet and they were coming down. So right at the end of the day, as he was closing, I said, come on, let's try and go up the lift. It was a drag lift. And then, of course, we ended up flat on our face. But that, that um, we went, we tried again and again and again, and eventually they started to let, let us on. And um, we wouldn't buy a pass, but we would, they would just let us on at the end of the day. And that's at a last lift um so that was that and what was the feeling like because i mean it, with was it easy to sort of get on with with homemade boards could you get the feeling of it no not at all <laughs> uh, you know we didn't really have any edges and i remember at one point realizing that we'd have to put an edge on this board so I managed to find it was some draft ex aluminium draft excluder, and I managed to cut bits <laughs> off it and make this right angled aluminium edge and put it at the back of the board. And I think I'd seen it again in a, a copy of Transworld or Thrasher or something like that. And we tried to replicate that and then improve the bindings. You know, at that time we were riding in Doc Martens. <laughs> it was you know eight hole Doc Martin boots. Um. And then eventually sort of moved on to Sorrells and that kind of thing. And uh, so that was that was early 80s Scotland. So if it was hard to get the feeling, kind of what kept you motivated to do it? Like what was what was the thing? Um, my love of skating and then seeing the images that were coming out uh, from the States. You know, so you could kind of, so you could kind of see what was possible. So you were trying to replicate that. Yeah, absolutely. And then I think ooh, must have been 86 or something like that. A friend of mine, another skater, Peter Warmington, who was from Newcastle, he was a skier, but he was working out in Cormayeur ah. in the Oster Valley. And I went out, I took my skis with me and I was going to intention of doing a little bit of skiing as well. And Peter had bought one of the first ever funky boards. I don't know if you remember funky. The Italian... Not that I've ever seen one, but I am aware of I am aware of them. You see them online every now and again. Yeah, I think that was about eighty seven, and that was the first ever sort of manufactured board I had ever seen. 
and Peter was a size 11 and I'm a size eight. And then, um, and I never took, you know, any boots or anything else. So he had Sorrells and I think it was the early Sims binding that was on the funky board. And I just <laughs> basically put five pairs of socks on, put myself <laughs> in the boots. And I, and I took this board and I went straight to the, t- as high as I could go on a cable car. And it's just pretty high there, isn't it? And yeah, and just launched myself off. And it, it, fortunately for me, it was a, a day with a lot of, sort of fresh snow. And I made it to the bottom. I probably, you know, spent most of it on my backside or, or rolling down the hill. But I was totally hooked. And then, um, and I was, you know, from first lift to last lift for a whole week on this this board. And by the end of the week, I, I was, yeah, I was riding fairly well. Yeah. And then I made the decision at that point. I was moving out to the Alps. I just said, right, I'm coming out here. That's it. And then I bought my, I had a contact back in the UK with K2. And um, and I said, I want I want to get a snowboard. You know, and I knew them from skating. I said, I, I want to get a snowboard. And they brought over, I don't know if you remember, a K2 TX. It was a 170. Again, I know I know what you're talking about. I can't say I've seen one, but I do know yeah, what you're talking sort of about. Bright pink and bright yellow. So this board yeah. arrived and there was no inserts. There was nothing. There was no indication of where you had to put your feet on the board oh, or anything. That's right. And you the, had to get them drilled like skis, didn't you? And put the yeah, and there was screw actually the no on. side cut. And then a friend of mine, um, who again was a skater who you know used to go out to Del Mar all the time. He was a you know, he was out sort of skating in California. And I got him to bring me back a set of Sims bindings uh, from the States. And then I just, st- I remember standing in my mum's living room with this board. And I thought, right, that's, <laughs> I think that's how I'm going to stand. And I got, I just got a magic marker out and I sort of drew around my feet. And I went, yeah, that's the sort of stance I want. I want. And it's a sort of zero at the back and maybe 15 degrees at the front. Yeah. And then out with the drill. And it was like <laughs> drilling and screwing these bindings onto the board. And fortunately, I kind of got it bang on first time. <laughs> and I, honestly, I couldn't believe it. And that was it. Moved out to the Alps and um, started, you know, riding straight away. You know, this I think I went to team first. And I think it would have been about the end of October, beginning of November. That's when, you know, they had good snow. Yeah. And straight away, I bumped into some... At back in that at that in those days, I think that would have been about eighty six, something like that. Again, skate uh, snowboarders were still outcasts, still you know the rebels. So if you saw anybody else in the with a board, you were like, whoa, straight yeah. over. Well, it's funny that, isn't it? Because I turned up. I want to just sort of stop on that subject for a bit, just because. I mean, I moved out to Val d'Isere in ninety three. Yeah. And it was exactly that. It was, yeah. we got there, found somewhere to live. It was in the middle of November, so there was no one around. We went to the only bar that's open. It's like, we've got to meet people. And I saw a guy with an SS20 t-shirt on. Yeah. And it's like, I've just bought my board from there. He's got an SS20 t-shirt on. He's a snowboarder. We're instantly mates. Absolutely. And, that was, and, that, and that was it. You know, like, we were the only snowboarders in town at that point. Yeah. And any any more that you met, you just became instant friends with them because you had this common bond that wasn't very common. That's right. Yeah, there was that sort of commonality, and again, it, that it was the same in skating. You know, so I, I was used to that from the sort of skating side. So you were used to hundreds of people sort of looking at you, you know, with disdain and disgust, and like you shouldn't be here doing that. And it was exactly the same in the ski areas. Um. You know, everywhere we went, and um, and I, and I hooked up with people that I stayed friends with for a long time. You know, them Serge Cornia, a lot, a lot. Of the, it was the French guys, and you couldn't miss them because they wore the most horrendous, hideous, oxbow type <laughs> gear. You know, all that sort of fluo, you know, fluorescent sort of clothing, which I which I detested really. But um, yeah, so we would just go up, and we were learning from each other, and it was almost. Um, how would you describe it? Sort of collective development. Yeah. You know, we, with three or four of us would be out riding and somebody would do something and they would say, how did you do that? And they'd say, oh, all right, you know, I'm just applying sort of pressure here and doing that, you know. Uh, and then we'd walk, they'd do it again and we'd watch and then we'd try it and then we'd try and better that. And then yeah. the same hitting little wind lips and it'd be like, 
yeah, okay, we're going to do this. And, you know, but back in those days, the kit was rubbish and then um, <laughs> compared to nowadays, but we just got on with it and we just enjoyed every single minute of it. Yeah, that must have been quite special in a way because obviously now there's, well, certainly for a while, there was as many snowboarders on the mountain as there were skiers. Yeah. Whereas back then it really was a really re- tiny community, even smaller than it was when I turned up there, you know. Mm. Yeah. And that must have been quite special. Yeah. And even the, you know, all the sort of people that I met, um, even back at the, in that time, like Axel Poperty from Belgium and a lot of the Swiss guys, um, it didn't matter where we were from, mm. you know, the fact that I was from Scotland and they were from Switzerland or Austria or, you know, France, it didn't matter, you know, and even if we didn't speak each other's language, we just um, still were able to communicate through what we loved, which was like being on the board. Yeah. Was there a lot of, was there much hate towards you from skiers and the, like, the, the peace t- and all that sort of stuff? Not from the peace um, because the pisters could under, understand and identify who were fairly decent riders and who weren't, you know. So I think they were more concerned with the ones who were a little bit, uh, how should we say, d- yeah, probably dangerous. Yeah. Uh, but more often than not, we just wanted to go off and do our own thing. And at that time, skiing was all about just looking completely crap on the piste, you know, the world. <laughs> To scheme with our feet together and standing tall with ridiculous clothing. Whereas we just wanted to head off, off to the edge of the pieces, and we were just looking for anything to huck off. To be to be perfectly honest, yeah. Um, so the, and the pace doors kind of left us alone. But the the abuse you used to get in lift queues from skiers, right? It's always about you're out of control, you're dangerous. This shouldn't be allowed on the mountain. Um, but to be honest, that that quickly changed. It did quickly change. You know, I would say that was only maybe for a couple of seasons. And then as more and more sort of people started getting on boards, it, it did change and we were a little bit more accepted. But you said 93 was a little bit like that too. Yeah, but- I think so. There was definitely, I mean, it had obviously grown quite a lot, but it was still, you know, there was still sort of packs of snowboarders riding around. And I remember, you know, we'd just, you'd bump into a, little French crew or something and you just start riding with them. Yeah. And they'd be like, oh, we're going here. And you just go with them. It was no like, it was a, just a little all welcoming club at that time. And it was yeah. really great. Really great. I don't, cause I remember the first time I went to up to Flaine in France and um, someone came running up to me and they were like, oh, you need to go and speak to Jean-Michel Grissy. And I was like, what, you're a snowboarder, you know, go and speak to this guy. And uh, and I went in and I spoke to him and he was like, oh, right, well, let's go out riding. And, out, and he was on the phone to people and just getting this little crew together. And and I was like, I've just arrived here. And I seemed <laughs> to be welcomed into this sort of family. And that was what was wonderful about it, which I think, sadly, a lot of the younger boarders coming into it now don't really experience that because yeah. they're... There are so many sort of other people around. Yeah, it has changed, hasn't it? And maybe not for the better in in that in sort of in that sense. But obviously, there's loads of other things that are great yeah. about it now. And um, so let's. So how long did you sort of did you base yourself in France? Were you living out there full time? Like what what yeah, was happening? I decided. I decided. It was after that. You know time I was on Peter's board in, in Cormier and I thought right I'm coming out and that was it and then went back out the following year uh, so I was between kind of Flame and Chamonix and that's sort a of Haute Savoie area and, and I managed to get a job working at nights and I, I realised I needed to spend every single minute of every single day snowboarding so I thought I don't want a day job <laughs> so I got a job in a restaurant and um, Danielle Lilas this guy who who's an old hippie he was amazing he had a few restaurants so I ended up getting on really well with him and working for him and working you know a restaurant job in a ski resort is the best you start at five o'clock in the evening you get fed yeah you know and you finish at a decent time so if you still want to go out and have a few beers with people you can and it was and that sort of sort of kept me going and how long did you do that for oh I was I was out in the Alps more than 12, 13 years in total. Oh, wait, really? Yeah, but in the early days, the first season, you know, um, 
I actually slept in someone's cupboard. It was a guy who was a, <laughs> was a, a guy who was a rep for a holiday company, and he had a, an apartment, and he had this sort of like I don't know how you describe it as a a ski store sort of yeah yeah and yeah, yeah. To the apartment that was just big enough to put a single mattress in, and I was yeah. like, right, I'm going to live there. So I stayed in that for a season, a whole um, season whole season in a cover oh man a guy that a guy that came out with us i think i talked about this on ed's episode there was a guy i can't remember his name but basically four of us went out and then one lad was really young and he just couldn't handle it and went home sort of after about a week and then there was three of us and i got a job kind of in a chalet sort of helping out and then i sort of dragged my mate matt in with that and there was one guy left. He's actually called Richard, I remember. I can't remember his surname. But he was like, I've got nowhere to live. And just and moved into a ski locker for about three months. And then he got a job at Dick's and sort of moved out of it. And yeah. I just I used to see him and he just looked so ill all the time. He was awful. back then you didn't care, you know. You know, I was young and I really didn't care. I would have done, I would have, you know, dug a snow hole and bought a decent sleeping bag if that Absolutely. meant you know, I managed to get sort of every day out in the hill. But uh, but back in those days, you know, as we were saying earlier on, there were so few people around that there wasn't that many good boarders. Yeah. So everybody got it. All the ones that were fairly good got to know each other quite well right. and were very supportive of everybody. So when the sort of media and companies all decided to want to get on board and think, oh, this snowboarding, that really fits in with their demographic. There started to be a lot of good sort of sponsorship deals and a little bit of money kicking around. And uh, and I was fortunate enough really early on, I think my second season in the Alps, I met a guy called Olivier Blanc from Paris, who was the service press for the uh, snowboarding federation of france and he was connected to eurosport and tf and all the sort of french um sort of television and magazine outlets and olivier and i got on really really well so he put me in touch with people so we started going off to various events that were sort of being put on and we were getting paid for that we were getting sort of show money no you know, just, just turning up to sort of ride and um and that was what really sort of set me into the more sort of professional side of snowboarding, shall we say? Yeah. Uh, and, start, and a lot of the early competitions were, I mean, it's, it, I don't know if you remember Cool Toi, the Swiss radio station based out of Geneva that played all the great music, you know. Anyway, no. they, they, every weekend, they organised these snowboarding festivals up in Lausanne in Switzerland. Oh, yeah. So there was um, the Ice Rippers, which was the name of the snowboarding club in Geneva. Um, so everybody used to go to Lausanne at the weekends. Mm. So we used to drive over. And it, there was they would have parties on, and they had amazing sort of sponsorship from drinks companies and things. So everybody could go and get completely smashed. And, not, <laughs> and there was food laid on, and you wouldn't have to pay for anything. Amazing. And then the next day, they would have these really ropey sort of competitions, like hand-cut half pipes. You, you remember those. Just basically big piles of snow in a rough sort of U-shape. And then people would just use the ends of their boards or shovels if they had them to try and sort of make something to launch off. But nobody cared. It was all about being part of something. And we all knew we were going to be part of something special and something that was, you know, building up. Yeah. Uh, and, so uh, and from that, that's when I first started to get in, again, through Jean-Michel Gracie. Um, and another guy, I met another guy called Robbie Condor, who was a really early pioneer of snowboard what? teaching. Robbie was, Condor, that name rings up. Where he, he do made, I know that from? He ended up being a big wig with uh, Oxbow. Right. In the end. But he started off, he was the oh, first person. Yeah. He was, in, he was in Austria when the Voss, the, I don't know if you remember, there was the Voss. It was the first right. ever snowboard instructor's qualification. Well, Robbie had that. And, and then I met Robbie and we used to go riding all the time. And we, he was a skater as well. So Robbie and I used to sort of skate. And then as soon the day that the snow arrived, poof, skateboards would be in the cupboard and we'd be sort of out in snowboards. But through Robbie and again Jean-Michel, that was I started to get sort of decent sponsorship deals, you know, 
Claudine. Yeah. Well, it's interesting, isn't it? Like, were you getting your kind of hookups through sort of Europe rather than yeah. UK? Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, when I left the UK, I, I, I that was it. I, I immersed myself straight into the European scene, and yeah. everybody. I didn't know any other British riders. I never met any, and um, for a few years. So I was, bit, you know, I, and I knew. I kind of heard through the grapevine there was a, a UK scene sort of kicking off. I remember this was this was still the late eighties, yeah. And there was sort of stuff happening in the dry slopes, but I was never back in the UK. You know, mm. I, I used to go back, you know, a week a year to see my parents, and and I just stayed in Europe. And sure, well, why so not? I, so I kind of missed it all, and um, and in a way, I kind of later. It was later on I realised I, st- I missed out on something. You know, I should have been. Uh, I should have tried to have become part of it. Uh, and then even when I did, because you know, I met Eddie Spearing and Sang Tan and all those guys and, um, you know. Legends in the game, though. Yeah, are. so, and I knew them, and I, I met them at various things in the Alps, and they were like, oh, you know, they didn't know me. I, yeah. I didn't, didn't really know them. But they were like, how come you're not, you know, part of the scene? I mm. said, well, I live, I live here, you know, and I, I've never ridden in a dry slope or, or done any of that sort of stuff. So then I think it was Eddie that sent me a message to say they were having a British Championships thing in Andorra. Right. So I was like, oh, okay, right, okay. And at that time I was doing all the European comps. I was did the Tessier Cup and the Fanatic Cup and all of these kind of things. So I went down to this competition down in Andorra, which I think it was about, I don't know, it would have been yeah, late 80s. I think it was maybe the first one. And nobody's really had any idea what they were doing. Um, you know, and I, 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 <laughs> But that was what was great about it. Yeah, Chris. exactly, exactly. And, and, I, and I drove down and I got held, in, held up in a bit of a snowstorm. So I was late arriving and I think it was John arrived at this table that was just set up in a sports hall. And I think it was Johnny Barr. And uh, and I rocked up at this table and I said, oh, I'm, I'm here to sort of register. And he goes, oh, it's, everything's packed away. You know, they're too late. You know, it's too late. And I was like, what? I've just driven <laughs> 12 hours to the to get here. And I kind of, you know, you know, threw a bit of a wobbly and I think I kicked the tape table over and he was like, whoa, 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 it's okay, it's okay. And then they added me onto this list and I was like, what What have you got? Have you got a half pipe? Uh, well, sort of. And they, they had this basic board across and had a giant slalom. And I was like, oh, okay, right. So the first day was the giant slalom. And because I was the last person there, I was, there was about 130 riders, I think. And I was, so I was about 130th to go down this giant slalom. Man. So, Everybody had gone down. There was all these people, Ian Trotter and Lloyd Rogers, and those people who were all yeah. into that kind of hard boot stuff. And they were all down at the bottom, and they were basically celebrating their win because all these other people that were coming down, we were coming down like a, a giant slalom course that had the two foot berms <laughs> in each bend. That was the last person to come down, and I just absolutely nailed it. And um, and I was coming down a part, you know, and they were all telling me later on, they were all basically celebrating their wins at the bottom. And then somebody went, oh, <laughs> wait a minute here. Check this guy out. So I came, I was flying down, and they reckoned I was about five or six seconds ahead of whoever it was that was even no winning. Way. But then I, then I blew out on the, about the third last gate from the end. You know, and the, the, that slalom stuff, they put funny sort of configurations of pole in. I didn't even know what I was doing. So I just blew out. I didn't care. I didn't care about that anyway. That that was never my thing. Yeah. So then all of a sudden they were like, "Whoa, God, this this guy can actually ride!" And so I started to meet all these people. And um, yeah, and then I did the other comps, and it was really rootsy, and it was really cool, and it was really nice to be part of it. But I just thought this competition scene—it's not really for me. No. Um, so, so then lo and behold you know I was like not really that interested because I had gone off to I got invited to go away to uh, Kamchatka heli skiing or heli snowboarding in Russia okay who'd you go with, there with um, SOS Sportswear of Sweden company. oh right yeah 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 yeah. so they sponsored me at the time and they were taking a group of uh, six of us and they said oh we're going over to Russia 
when we're getting this big Russian helicopter. So I was into the kind of free riding kind of thing, you know, back before it was even a before it was even a thing. It was just going snowboarding then, wasn't it? Yeah, that was it. We just said, oh, we're just we're just going riding, and you know, because a lot of us were street skaters. We didn't want to go down a, a groomed piece. We we wanted to jump off the lips at the edge, and we sure wanted to thing. find little rock drops and that kind of stuff. And uh, so, um, so I I wasn't interested in competition. And then lo and behold, I got a phone call. I think I can't even remember who it was. It might have been Eddie or it might have been Santan or someone. And they were saying, "Oh, we want to put a team in for the Nations Cup. Would you like to do it?" And I was like, and then they said, we'd like you to, because I was based in the Alps and I knew, and again, through Olivier, I knew all the organisers of these competitions. And they said, would you be team manager and sort it all out? So I, think, <laughs> so I was like, yeah, okay. And um, so I managed to get it sorted out. And we, and so that was, the first one was in Avorias and that was a half pipe and a, a GS thing. So I think it was myself, Ian Trotter, maybe Neil McNabb. Yeah, I think Neil was around um, by then. Becky. Yeah. Yeah. I, do you know what? I can't actually even remember. Oh, fair enough. So we did that. And then, then they asked me if, to be the team captain to go take a British team to the World Championships in Ischgl in Austria, Sweet. which was in 1993. How were you sort of welcome there? Was it? Was it a bit like, uh, you know, the film Cool Runnings? Did it feel a bit like you were a sort of novelty side act and Eddie, no. like Eddie, um, Eddie the Eagle and all that sort of stuff? Or I would say, no, f- far from it, because at that time, the what you know, a lot of the Brits who were doing really well in the dry slope stuff, you know, they were they were really putting the hours in on the dry slopes and they were mm. absolutely nailing these tricks. It was like trick, trick, trick. Um, so when they came to the snow they could just basically hit a lip and then pull these tricks off 100% yeah. of the time. So straight away, there, there was a lot of respect there. Whereas people like myself, you know, who were riding in the snow all the time, we were like, oh, pff, oh look at that, look at that cool one. Let's hike up there, let's do that. And there was always something else. You didn't want to waste eight hours of your day hiking up and just popping off a ramp somewhere doing a mm. trick like, oh, no there's much more much more to snowboard than, than that so i would have said that that first ever world championships in east school we went there and they they knew that there was a lot of british riders especially you know um people who could really nail these tricks yeah. sort of every time uh which was which was which was great but uh but in the end you know our team you know, we weren't, we weren't sort of particularly great, and again, it was the first ever world champs, and it was a bit, it was a bit odd. There was all these ridiculous rules, like you know, with leashes and things like that. And I remember Brian Iguchi coming up to me at the top of the half pipe and going, "They're not going to let me ride because I've not got a leash." And I, <laughs> so I took, I took, I took a lace off my boot. Yeah. And, get, and gave it to Brian, and I said, "Just tie that. That should keep them happy." <laughs> so, um, so, so, oh yes. man, if you hadn't done that, Brian Gucci's, you know, it could have been like a sliding doors moment for Gucci, yeah. couldn't it? Think so, of, so, think yeah, of what so, we'd have missed out on. Yeah, so the Gucci got to ride. Yeah, and then, <laughs> then I'm, I got to hang out with him and and Terry and and uh, Jake actually at that event. And I got this invite from Jake Burton. I got this message saying Jake Burton wants to take you to dinner. <laughs> so okay, like, right, yeah, 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 right. Well, hang on a minute. Let's let's let's. Jake Burton wants to take you for dinner. Yeah. So I thought, what the, you know, how has this come about? So lo and lo- behold, I met Jake and rocked up, and we sat down. And he, the first question he asked me was, he said, "There's another company in the UK called Burton." So he said, I, I'm struggling to register the name Burton in the UK. Wh- who is this other Burton? So I said to Jake, I said, don't worry. They make like business clothes and suits and stuff like that. You know, I said, I think it's Burton menswear. Yeah, for sure. So, and I think it was from that conversation that he, and I said, so all these questions, were are they really established? Are they big? And I went, yeah, 
they are big. That said, they've got shops and every, every high and street. Yeah. So I think it was through that that he realised. I think at the time they're going to they were going to have to try and do something else. So I think it was B thirteen or something they ended up with. Yeah, it was B thirteen. Um, in Becky's episode, Becky Malthouse. Yeah. She ended up working for them for a summer, kind of dremeling off Burton logos off boots and stuff yeah. like that. So, so I kept in. You know, it was really nice. You know, I got on really well with Jake and. There was a lot of commonality there with language and talking about the kind of early days. Yeah. And although Jake wasn't a kind of skater himself, um, he got on really well with Tom Sims. Anyway, and and um, so we kind of talked a little bit about that. And and uh, so at this dinner, there was myself, Jake, Terry Hackinson, who was a little kid at that yeah, time. Yeah, he was a child I then, think, wasn't he? I think he was 15, but he... Boy, was he good! And then, and then there was a Gucci, and um, yeah, so that was kind of cool. And do you know that at that time it really meant kind of nothing to me. I was like, oh, I just went for dinner with a, a guy who's trying to sort of set up his business and everything like that. But um, yeah, kept in touch with them, and uh, you know, from then on, and met him a few times. I went out to Tahoe and. Then when I got signed for Vans as well, I kind of bumped into him at a few things. Yeah, and it was all it was very nice, you know. Have you watched? Um, I didn't know about this, but there's a movie called Dear Rider that's basically sort of about his life. He, he apparently he started it before he died, and then um, Donna, his wife, sort of got it finished. No, I, no, do you know I haven't. It's I, haven't. A, I watched it a couple of weeks ago. It's a really wonderful thing. It's like you've got it's on YouTube. And it's yeah. a few, it's a few quid or whatever, but sort of fair enough, you know. After all, Jake Burton gave us, we can spare a few quid yeah. for whatever cause it's going to. Um, yeah, it's a really beautiful thing. And if you did know him, I'd sort of definitely say it's worth yeah. a watch because it would probably yeah. spark a lot of memories for you. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, no, he was a, he was a sound guy. He was, he was a businessman, that's for sure. Yeah, I mean, it was interesting, you know, when we, you know, I turned up in, I think, my sessions gear or whatever it was at that time. You know, and uh, the other riders at the table were the same, but but um, Jake came and he was, you know, looked smart. He looked like he was going to do business deals and things like that. So yeah. I stood out a little bit. Uh, but yeah, very, very genuine guy who was so focused on the development of snowboarding. 100%. Yeah. He knew what he needed to do, uh, which was great. Yeah. Oh, bless him. God rest his soul. Um, okay, so let's. I'm looking at your timeline. There's so many things to go at. First solo descent of Mont Blanc. Oh well, yeah, that was that was '93. Uh, but I've just seen the the uh, invited by Ski Sunday to do a first major feature on snowboarding. I'm interested in that because obviously we interviewed yeah. Ed, who now is the yeah. sort of current presenter. Yeah. So in, in it was late '93. I think it was March '93. Um, I just, for some reason, I knew that season I was going to climb and snowboard down Mont Blanc. And I wanted to do it, and I spoke to a whole lot of people. And, um, yeah, I managed to do it, you know, and it, was, it wasn't easy, but managed to do it. So it was through that um, I got contacted. It kind of made the papers and things like that at that time. But then I got contacted by the BBC who wanted to do a feature on snowboarding. They hadn't really done much. On, I don't think they'd done anything on snowboarding at that time. So they said, would you come out to, uh, I think it was Val, yeah, Val Gardena in Italy. And this was one of the first ever downhills. It was in December. So they flew me out to Val Gardena. You know, I was in, in Switzerland at the time. And then they flew me across to Italy and picked me up and took me up. And then we sort of did the interviews. And it was, I think it was about a 15-minute piece. Wow. You know, it was about snowboarding. And a lot of it was about sort of backcountry riding and the sort of safety aspect of that. And they were talking about sort of avalanches and responsible riding and things. Um, and that all came from the, the Mont Blanc thing. Uh, so that yeah that was kind of that's quite amazing and what i might try and do is speak to ed and see if he can put in a request to yeah, try and, and find I, that I, footage yeah or... so i should be able to tell you when it was as well so they showed some footage of uh up on the mont blanc massif as well so there's myself and jerome ruby and you've probably heard of jerome yeah yeah so it was myself and jerome and daddy i think in the footage um so yeah 
Yeah, so I, I'll be able to send you the link of when that was broadcast. Yeah, so that yeah, would be... that'd be amazing. If we could sort of find it and maybe if the BBC yeah. can unearth it, that would be incredible. Yeah. Okay, there's where else should we go? Um, I'm interested in Sean Farmer in Valdez. Oh, oh yeah. So um, I did the when I went the first time I went out to Alaska was. Uh, to do the King of the Hill, I got invited to compete at the King of the Hill. That That's was what after it was that. called, wasn't it? Yeah, it was called the King of the Hill at that time because I had uh, I competed at the the Verbi Extremes in '96. Yeah, again, that was the first the first of the free ride world tour thing. So I got invited to that, and most of the guys I was riding with and competing against at um, in Verbi were also the ones that were involved in the sort of King of the Hill in Alaska and the Wanaka Hill Challenge. So I got invited out uh, to compete in the King of the Hill in Alaska. And <laughs> I mean, that was wild times. The footage I've oh, seen from that is, you know, people letting off guns. Yeah. Oh, that, that was one cars. of the first, first things that we did. It was like, oh, let's go to the gun range. And the gun range in Valdez is at the end of the airport runway. And it's like, <laughs> what what do you want? You know, and it's like, oh, oh, here's here's an Uzi, here's a Magnum. <laughs> it's like, oh. so all of us Europeans, there was myself and Serge Cornea and Axel and a uh, Martin Franimitz and stuff from Austria, and we were all like, oh, guns, <laughs> get us in there. You know, and this is after been 12 beers or something. <laughs> so so we kind of thought that we were kind of wild sort of cowboys until we met the farm, as we called them. Absolute nut job. The first time we were driving up to the helipad one morning, and we're talking, it was, you know, Alaska, it was about minus 20. It was a clear day. And we were in this RV driving up to the helipad, and this car goes flying past. A guy with a Hawaiian, Hawaiian shirt on, arms out, um, Ray-Ban aviators on. <laughs> bashing this car off the sides of the snowbank at the side <laughs> of the wall. So when we arrived at the uh, helipad just after sort of Sean, and he basically crashed this car into a snowbank at the helipad and uh, just got out and left it running and just and walked across. And we were like, hey, you've left your car running. He goes, it's not my car. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that was the first uh, thing. And then... Oh, on the last night after the prize giving, they decided to have a big bonfire outside the hotel and ran short of wood. So all of a sudden, we, you know, there's a smashing, if I can remember rightly, because we we all had uh, consumed quite a lot of um, alcohol and things. And then um, so there was a smashed window and all this furniture suddenly appeared out of a window, second story window. And they all got put in the bonfire and apparently it was farmer. So, um, yeah, an absolute. What was it like? Were you guys accepted sort of into that? Because it's quite, a, I imagine at the time it was quite an insular scene because it wasn't easy yeah. to get to. It cost a lot of money. And those yeah, guys but... had the run of it, didn't they? How did they, like, how, how was it when you guys turned up and were like, yeah, it, we're part of this? Yeah, it was, um, I mean, I, I was accepted straight away in with sort of American writers because at that time, you know, I had been sponsored by Vans for a long time. I got involved in Vans r right in the infancy in UK and in Europe. You know, okay. James was the Vans importer at the time, um, was sort of bringing the sort of first Vans shoes and the Vans sort of snowboards and snowboard boots across. So I was involved with Vans from day one uh, in the UK and in, in, in Europe. So I was kind of part of that um Vans family, they're very good at kind of looking after sort of people in Vans, or they were at that time. And um, so I, I went to ride with a lot of the American riders. We went to Japan. Uh, I went to Japan with a whole bunch of them and met them over there. And that was a bit of riotous, and everybody ended up getting arrested. You know, for, we were all skateboarding as well. <laughs> you know, skate. I don't know if you've ever been to Tokyo, but we decided. I we all decided we were going to sort of skateboard in Golden Guy, which is these tiny little narrow streets where all these izakayas are, and uh, where a lot of the kusa hang out. And they didn't take kindly to sort of eight <laughs> skateboarders absolutely pissed out their heads, suffering from ba really bad jet lag. 
skateboarding down these alleyways and uh, frightening. So we ended up, yeah, all getting into a bit of trouble there. But so yeah, so basically from the kind of van scene, when I went out to Alaska, and was, I, I knew a lot of the guys, right? And, and p- even people like Mark Sullivan, who was the editor of Snowboarder Magazine at that time. Sure. Um. So kind of went riding with people like that, and uh, yeah. So it was kind of. It, it, it was almost like those really, really early days when it was just like, oh, yeah, there's, you know, you, you, another sort of, well, they, they called us big mountain riders at that time. Uh, oh, big mountain riders are all here. And we were all there for the same thing. We were all there to sort of try and push ourselves and learn from each other and um, try out new lines and, and basically and support each other. And even though it was a competition, it was like you would be discussing what you were going to do with people. Yeah, and so, oh, I quite fancy going down there. And they go, well, you could probably do a little layback off that, and then sort of pop into there, and and then um, everybody, nobody cared who won or lost. It was just yeah. all about participating, really. I think that's still, I think that's a a trait that's carried on through snowboarding, even when you see it at the Olympics, like yeah. the athlete, you know, the riders are at the bottom, rooting for everybody else just to do to do their thing rather than yeah. It's not like, a, oh, they're going to beat me. It's a, we want snowboarding to do well out of yeah. all of this thing. You know, if that's the thing that comes out of it is that snowboarding does well. Yeah. And I love that. That's, I'm glad that's a trait that has, that we do still have. Cause I think that's an amazing thing. Yes. Okay. Right. Um, quickly, let's talk about being invited to Vegas in the Playboy bunny jet. Just <laughs> just because, I mean, when am I ever going to get to say that again? Come on. Yeah. I, I, have you ever been out to Alaska at all? No, I haven't, sadly. Okay, well, well, one of the things, especially if you go kind of earlier on in the winter, um, you're not getting, everybody sort of looks at these, sort of the video footage and the photographs and magazines and it's blue skies and deep powder snow, but it's not always like that. You get big storms coming through and nothing happens for a long time. So you end up sort of spending a lot of time in the bars. So one of these storms came through and I just happened to be sitting. We were doing a film for the BBC called King of the... Uh, it was called King of the Hill, actually. It was a oh, part yeah. of the Extreme Live series. So we were out there sort of filming. And uh, so I was sitting in a bar having a beer and some chicken wings. And um, I was just chatting to these guys, uh, American guys. And they were like, again, you know, slightly sort of pissed. And they were from all from Vegas. And they were all involved in the adult entertainment industry, shall we say. <laughs> um, in a big way, you know, the, one of them worked for Hugh Hefner and, you know, all these things. So they had um, flown up there in a private jet. And Do you need to get your front door? Hang on, just give me a sec. <laughs> Go for it. Zach, answer the door. Oh. <laughs> so I've got a, a 12 year old who's on his PlayStation ignoring the world. Yeah, I've got one of those. But anyway, so yeah, they, they were involved in the adult entertainment industry. They had flown up, and sadly, the weather had socked in, and they were like, oh, phew, we're just going to like fly back to Vegas tomorrow because we've got the weather forecast in. He said, Do you want to come? And I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm all up for that. I said, we'll come down for sort of three days and then we'll we'll fly back up. And it was it was on the bunny jet, it was on the Playboy jet. <laughs> and uh, so I said to Steve Robinson, who was the producer and one of the assistant producers, he said, Oh, we've been invited, we're going to Vegas. And then he was like, Steve was kind of up, up for it. And then the other guy, the assistant producer at that time, was a real straight-laced guy. And he was going, um, I, we're here on, you know, the licensed payers' money. If when yeah, yeah. anything gets out about this, then we're you're going to be in big trouble. So we then had to turn it down. And I was absolutely gutted. And I was thinking, because we could have gone. They, they, they said that they had the whole top floor of Caesar's Palace or something. But these guys were legit. We, they were legit, you know, because we saw the jet. And I was like, oh, that was just something else. Um, oh, man. Yeah. Gutted that didn't happen. Some of these things that happen and you know, probably still happens to this day as well to lots of people. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Is, is, is Playboy Bunny still a thing? You sort of feel that that's probably not a thing anymore, right? 
and, and um, probably rightly so, you know. It's yeah. definitely of its time. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure. But, uh, yeah, I didn't care. I was, you know, we have been, I think I'd drunk a bottle of Crown Royale by that point. So I was like, yeah, I'm going. Well, it'd be yeah. hard, you know, back in the day, it'd be hard to turn that down, right? Well, how did snowboarding sort of pan out for you? Like, when, have you stopped? Like, what, what's, what are you doing? Yeah, well, what I, I think it was after about the, I think I did the Verbi Extremes in 96 and then kind of dropped out a little bit. Right. And then 99 went back to do the, the went back to do the King of the Hill thing. And at that time, again, I was, I was never in it for sort of competitions. Yeah. I always wanted just, I wanted that feeling of just riding mountains and really enjoying myself. And I, and I still do that to this day. I like to ride on my own. And uh, so I kind of, at that, and I, I didn't want to be part of the snowboarding scene as it was at that time, because it was getting very, very commercialized. There was lots of like really, really talented sort of young riders coming through. Yeah. And I thought, yeah, just the, you know, we're nothing compared to these young guys that are coming through now. And I thought, yeah, just, you know, you know, I've had my day. I've really enjoyed it. It's been excellent. Uh, I'm going to keep doing it. But then I, you know, started just having a real job. And then I still get my six weeks a year in, you know, out in the Alps and heading out in a couple of weeks' time for a few weeks. Um, yeah, and I just wanted... I didn't want to burn out and lose interest. Right. I just wanted to keep it special and keep it kind of smaller scale, shall we say? Yeah. Um, so that if, I mean, every time you know I arrive in the Alps and look at the snow, I just get this amazing feeling, and I just think, oh, I just can't wait. You know, I'm mean, actually getting really excited now, and I'm not going to wait for twelve days until twelve days. I'm just so looking forward to it. I'm just so looking forward to just strapping that board on and and going, you know. I do know. I do know. It's been yeah. it's been a few years for me, and uh, I am that person. Who, well, I think a lot of people who sort of were doing it back in, not necessarily back in the day, but back in a day, where kind of family life takes over and. Yeah. You know, I've got three kids, and I'm definitely that person who it was, it was probably, my, it was yeah. my whole life. You know, like my whole life revolved around going snowboarding for quite a long time. Yeah, and then you think, oh, I can, you know, maybe try something else, and you sort of then get involved in other things, and then yeah. families and kids and stuff. And I sort of manage, I you know, to be fair, I've had I've had more than my share of days on a snowboard. And even man, you know, still managed to sort of get away every year for a while. Yeah. But it's been a few years, and I am absolutely itching to go away. Like I've realised it's it's a bigger part of my life than maybe I thought it was. Yeah. Is that yeah. something you can kind of recognise? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, even even now to this day, you know, skateboarding and snowboarding are everything to me. Even yeah. still skating, you know, this I was listening uh, this morning to Jamie Thomas. I don't know if you know Jamie Thomas, the skater, sort of talking about talking to Tony Hawk and Jason Ellis on the podcast. And if you want a story about resilience and perseverance, whoa, you've got to watch it. I mean, it, I'm amazing. And um, and it really sort of hit hard with me thinking, yeah, that's you know, I can really identify with what Jamie was saying about his early days in skateboarding in California. And I thought, yeah, it was kind of like that. And and some of the American riders, you know, they have the opportunity over there because the industry is so much bigger to sort of carve out a career in it. But yeah. very few people, there's not a lot of people, you know, make a career out of snowboarding or skateboarding. Um, but the ones that do are quite high profile. Um, yeah, and I just... I'll, it'll never the the love will never die. It'll always be there, you know. And uh, you know, when my day finally comes, you know, <laughs> I hope it's sort of, you know, I drop off the biggest cliff and hold the long grab, <laughs> and then it ends. <laughs> <laughs> That's incredible. I am quite interested in how you because you said you're going away for six weeks. 
Yeah. How do you sort of structure your life and everything around being able to do that? Yeah. Well, I work. I work in education now. I, uh, you know, I'm an education officer. Um. So yeah, the holidays are pretty good in education. And, and my my son is you know big into sort of skiing now. You know, he's getting interested in sort of snowboarding as well. So you know, we tend to put all our energy and focus and money into you know, always going away in the winter. So it's always, you know, two or even three weeks if we can, Christmas and New Year, then out in the February holidays, and yeah. then a few weeks at Easter as well. Okay. And I, I really love late season, um, you know, the sort of Easter time. It's great. You know, I love the slush. And, oh, it's uh, just those days where the evenings and you sort of come oh, down late yeah, and it's yeah. really slushy, but you've got a board that can deal with it. Yeah. And, you know, and I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm, also, in, you know, I sometimes have the occasional trip down to South America. I mean, my friend Serge Cornea, he lives in Las Lenas in oh. Argentina. So, you know, get the chance to sort of go down there um, as well, if you know, if I need that sort of snowboard fix in the summertime. But, yeah. But as I've got older, you know, I'm quite happy just chilling out in the summer and just counting the days down until the snow falls, so. Really excited at the moment with all the snow that's fallen in the Alps. Yeah, it looks good, right? Oh, it looks amazing. Yeah, really good. Where, where, where's your, where's your place of choice? Do you go back uh, and see friends? And yeah, yeah, it's nice to go back and sort of, sort of see friends. Um, and I've got a friend who lives in Milan. She's got an apartment in Chervinia, and she is she's elderly now, so she very rarely uses it in the winter. She uses it in the summer. Right, you know, to escape the sort of heat, so we kind of get to use that a lot in the the winter. So, yeah, it's a night. You know, I, I quite like being based in the Oster Valley, so we can ride sort of Chervinia, Champlain, Cormier, so Pila, drop over to Verbier. There's a lot of options, even you know, through the tunnel into Chamonix. So, yeah, you can go a lot of places within a, sort of an hour or two. Um, yeah, we were just over the other side in Borg Saint Maurice. Oh yeah, yeah just right on the border i loved it i loved yeah. i loved from one of our i always thought i'd do an article for white lines magazine or something like that called lose with views yeah. because one of the lose in our chalet that we had basically if you left the door open which wasn't like the best scenario for yeah. the other the inhabitants of the chalet but you could kind of see out and see the italian border up on the petit saint bernard yeah, and I always thought, how many people get to sit on a loo and see that, like whenever they want? I felt very blessed for that. Yeah, white lines. That was it. It was Tudor Thomas, wasn't it? Chard, it was but... chilled. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Can I remember sort of riding with, with Chard um, in Lee's Ark and stuff way back in the early days? He was a good rider. Yeah, he was a good rider. I remember seeing very him, him in Val d'Isère, just thinking, like, wow, who's yeah. that guy? Yeah, he was good. He was fast. He was very fast, um, which I liked, yeah. So, yeah, God, so you brought back another memory, which is amazing. <laughs> well, look, we're about an hour. I mean, I think there's probably loads more we could talk about, but for this one, let, yeah. let, let's stop it there because I think what you just said at the end there about your love of snowboarding still, I think that's a nice, a nice yeah. place to finish. And, you know, even, you know, this morning when I woke up and I was having difficulty sort of getting online and when I was waiting to get online for my, with my work computer, I got my phone out and I was like watching snowboarding videos on my phone. So, yeah, it never goes away. Which, um, all right, well, just on that, give me a snowboard movie that we should watch. TB5. TB5. Yeah, an old what's one. The, what's the standout? I mean, I, I remember TB2 implicitly. I've watched it a million um, times. The only reason I say that is because I was, I was kind of, we, I was kind of involved in it in a way. When I, when I lived in Chamonix, when a lot of the American um, film companies, you know, when Mac Dog and uh, TGR and Rap Pictures and them all came over, yeah, because I was a native English speaker, uh, you know, people like Neil Haynes and would put me in touch, you know, he was in, in that sort of world, that film and photography world, and he would put people in touch with me, and I kind of almost acted as a fixer. Right. So, yeah, so that, which kind of helped it, brought a bit of money in as well, so it was nice. Sweet. Okay, well, TB5, I every week 
I recommend a movie to watch. So I'll find the link to that and put that up. It, it was the one that sort of started to push a lot of like big mountain riding, you know, mm-hmm. fast, big hucks and yeah. It was TB5 Johan Olofsson's. Absolutely. Yeah, Johan. That's the one. That is the one. If anybody should, yeah, you should watch it just for that watch section. It. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It's the, yeah. It, it, it stands up even to what riders are doing today. 100%. And that was back in 96, I think, 96 or 97. Yeah, it would have been 96, 97 probably, wouldn't it? Yeah, back then. So that was that was Graham Chalmers. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. That was the epitome of what I hoped would happen with this podcast. People coming out of the woodwork to tell interesting stories that add to the fabric of the rich history that we have in the UK with snowboarding. Um. So, yeah, thanks, Graham. Really appreciate it. Love to see you on a mountain at some point. And um, the uh, image that's going to go with this show is of him riding a Burton Ouija 58, which was the board I always wanted that could never have. Anyway, enough of that. Right, so other things. Um, As we're talking about at the end there, TB5, that's the recommendation for this week. If you're going to watch a movie, go check that out. There will be a link in the show notes. Or it will be on the playlist on Thank You Snowboarding on YouTube. Uh, highlights in that movie, definitely Johan Olofsson, which is the music at the start of this episode. MD45, nothing to something. And uh, Johan's section still stands up as one of the key moments in big mountain riding, I would say. Certainly captured on film. Um, just hell for leather absolute hell for leather stream of consciousness snowboarding absolutely insane and even all these years later it still still holds its own so that's worth checking out um it's a great movie it's got everyone else in it brian aguchi dave downing noah Salaznik, hatchets you know like everyone you would expect to find in a in a standard film at that time and it's great so yeah that'll be up on the youtube channel So the other bit of news this week is that Mia Brooks won Young Sports Personality of the Year last night, which is an amazing um, achievement, really. It's nice to see snowboarding getting recognised among most what are mostly mainstream sports. Let's be honest, it's a kind of a bit of a sporty backslapping affair, isn't it? You know, the usual sports get get rolled out every year um not that i've ever really watched it before or certainly not for about the last 30 years um it's just a bit too sporty i'm not really that into sports but i saw that mia was in the mix for an award and you got to support that and i'm really proud and i we're all at the thank you snowboarding at the tsa want to send a big shout out to mia for picking that up at the age of 16 and currently crushing it around the world where i mean it's just unbelievable really um we are hoping to have her on the podcast of going out to lax in switzerland sometime in january where she currently lives and the idea being that we're gonna try and get an episode with her which will be amazing um especially since she's just picked this up i know she'll probably be in a lot more demand than she maybe was yesterday but who knows um we're hoping that she can uh, give us some time i think it'd be really interesting to find out what her take on snowboarding and british snowboarding and generally like her life in snowboarding having done already so much at such a young age um so yes yeah, stick around for that we'll obviously keep you posted when that is coming if you've got anything you'd like us to put up on your on our instagram you can send it to thank you snowboarding at gmail.com uh, if you've got anything you want us to read out on here to share with the community, you'll be more than welcome. Uh, Steve and Fiona Harwood, friends of mine from back in the Borg San Maurice days. They did a few seasons there. Steve used to work at uh, Prince's Shop, which was, I think at the time, also sort of home to second level sports who were the Burton distributors. So he's sort of a name around the scene. Uh, he sent me a clip of me, his wife Fiona and himself riding in San Foire, one unforgettable Saturday in San Foire. The sort of Saturdays were always good in in the mountains because it's transfer day, which means the mountains tend to be pretty empty. 
and um I guess we'd sort of figured out our work so that we didn't have to do any transfers on the Saturday or whatever it was. And we just scored the most insane powder day up there. Uh, if you've never been to San Far before, it's a small resort on the road up to Val de Zarentine. Uh It's got three lifts, or it certainly did only have three lifts at the time. It accesses some insane off-piste, the, the Fogliata being one of the all-time sort of off piece routes in the French Tarantaise Alps. And um, yeah, we scored it on a Saturday morning. We had like the t- doing laps of the top two lifts with nobody else on the mountain and a few feet of fresh powder. And uh, yeah, Steve unearthed unearthed a couple of clips, which I put up on our Instagram a couple of days ago. So yeah, they're only short and they're pretty low res, but it's great because I, I never really sort of got much footage or even photos of myself snowboarding. So um it was really a pleasure to see those again. See that maybe I had a little bit more style than I maybe thought I did. Or maybe less style than I thought I did. I don't know. I don't know. But anyway, yeah, it's cool. Instagram, thank you, snowboarding podcast. You'll find us there. Give us a follow and all that stuff. And if you want to get involved, if you want to share anything with the community, then please do. Thank you, snowboarding at gmail.com. So there's been a few good uh, episodes of The Bomb Hole recently. The Bomb Hole is an American snowboarding podcast and they get the heavy hitters on there. They've just recently had Sean White, who looks to me like he's trying to trying to give back to snowboarding these days, which is great, really, given that he sort of split opinion as to whether he was like this lone cowboy out to dominate everything or whether he was sort of part of the community. Um I think if you know his history, his family grew up, he was, you know, they lived in a van, they drove around to give him as much time snowboarding as possible. And obviously he got good at it and earned lots of money and, you know, fair play to him. But I guess probably through that he rubbed a few people up the wrong way. Anyway, it's good to hear his story and, uh, yeah, good to kind of hear that he's sort of back in the snowboarding community and doing what he can. Uh, They also had Mike Hatchett on, Mike Hatchett of Standard Films, who we mentioned earlier on, who did the TB series of films. They've got something new coming out. Um, It was really interesting, given I'm one of those people that studied those films from start to finish. I think TB2, I must have watched it about 100,000 times. Um, It's just embedded in my brain. So it's really good. It was really good to hear his stories. And they also had Donna Carpenter of jake burton's wife the late jake burton and that was a fascinating thing as well because as much as burton get lauded for being like corporate snowboarding it would appear that maybe they had a little a little flirt with trying to have everything you know they bought forum and they had shoes and they had a surfboard company and i think a skateboard company and how they've kind of sacked it off and gone back to their core their core business of snowboarding and everything to do with snowboarding. And I think that's really cool. And that was an an enlightening uh, episode as well, where she's talking about how the ISF kind of gave snowboarding to fists and there's all the politics of that. And she's still pretty angry about how that all panned out. And I think that might be something that we touch on in future episodes. We've tried to sort of give it a bit of a miss, but as we speak to more competition a few competition based people and certainly Mia Brooks, it'd be interesting to get her take on what that looks like. So yeah, that's quite interesting on the bomb hole. Uh, it wouldn't be an episode of thank you snowboarding without mentioning the snowboard asylum, keeping snowboarders in kit with what they need since the beginning in the UK. Really? I think I've got a snowboard UK with their first ever advert in. I'll try and uh, find that and put that up on, up on the Instagram. Um, yeah, the snowboarding, snowboard asylum. Uh, they've got more knowledge in their stores than you'll find anywhere else, certainly in the UK. Um, so if you do need some kit, if you don't know what you need and you're not sure or you need, you need some new boots, but you've got funny shaped feet, just get down there, try a load of stuff on, talk to the people and you'll come out with stuff that suits you that's going to make your snowboarding holiday or your dry slope experience or whatever it is better. Don't get your mate to tell you that you hold it up to your chin or any of that bollocks. Get what you need from the people that know what they're talking about and in the UK it certainly is the Snowboard Asylum. 
It's no coincidence that we're working together on this podcast. It's because they have been the glue in the UK scene from the beginning. Jeremy, Chris, Shannon, all the crew there deserve a massive shout out for being in the game for so long. And they know what they're doing and they know snowboarding. So if you do need some kit, go and check out Snowboard Asylum. Link will be in the show notes. And I think that's it for this week. Obviously, another massive congratulations to Mia Brooks for the recognition she got last night on the Young Sportsman Personality of the Year. And um, obviously, it's going to be Christmas. So from everyone, well, say me, me and Shannon from the TSA, everyone here at Thank You Snowboarding, thank you for listening. Thank you so much for the uh, warm reception these episodes are getting. Uh, it's been a real pleasure. All the stories that are coming out, everybody that's been getting in touch via the Facebook group. There's a great um, Facebook group called UK Snow His Snowboard History. You can go and check that out. There's lots of stuff sort of posted up on that. I try and cross post everything from our uh, Instagram up on that as well. Great community of people. So everyone that's reached out through that or any other the any any other way, then uh, yeah, we I really appreciate it. It was a bit of a I wondered how this would land, whether people are interested in hearing these stories. And it turns out that you lot do actually quite like it and have been telling me so. And that makes me fiercely proud of this community that we have and the history that we share. So thank you very much. So I'm going to wish you a very, very happy Christmas. I hope it's safe. I hope it's peaceful. I hope it gives you what you need. And um Let's start 2024 off with some shredding, shall we? Let's do it. All right, I'm out of here. Happy Christmas. Thank you, snowboarding. Peace.